If we're talking about, you know, on the one hand, we can say we want 100,000 Jewish immigrants a year. We can bemoan the fact that we're nowhere near that. But on the other hand, we say, but we can't deal with 20,000 refugees. It's not numbers. The problem isn't numbers. Uh, the question is, A, are you prepared to take that group in? Which is a social question, not an economic question. A, Israel has a very high birth rate compared with comparable West European countries or comparable European countries uh, or, North Amer or North American states. Um, the Israeli fertility is about one child per woman above what it is in other places. And if you can figure that Western Europe has fertility rates between one and a half and two children, the states are slightly over two, I believe, but it's that's so that's the rate. The Israeli fertility rate is three, if you look at it, in, for all the population, for the Jewish population, it's about 2.7 and rising. In other words, fertility is actually going up at the moment. Um, well, my reading of it is, it's an article I published with Avi Noam Meir about 15 years ago now. Uh, my reading of it is that this is a response and a reflection to the security situation, the, in, the, insta the geopolitical instability of the country, the, the struggle for, for the space, for the, for the place. Um, fertility is the way in which the group advances itself, enhances itself. Uh, we see a variety of other interesting examples. If you look at white South Africa under apartheid, if you look at Northern Ireland, uh, before, before the, uh, the agreements, um, fertility was... Be where you have a small enclave struggling for its place, you do find high, you do find high fertility and by contrast, where you have a, a small states with an, a big economic advantage, such as Singapore, or Taiwan, South Korea, you find specific, particularly low fertility. There is a discourse, a, a discourse of fertility around around the state, the the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, which doesn't need to be fueled necessarily by government pronouncements on the contrary. This comes in the, shall we call it, the, what sociologists would call the conscience collective, the, the way people think and talk. Um, in that sense, Israel is pronatalist in a way that other countries aren't. Um, you, see, you see it reflected in the level of childbirth, you see it reflected in the fact that the proportion of women in this country who stay childless through life is very, very small, as opposed to much, much higher proportions in Europe. Uh, you have very, very few women who have no, no children because of career, and you do have a not inconsiderable, shall we say, group of women who, even if they're not married, do have a, a late child uh, by themselves. So in that sense, the, the social pressure to have a child is much is high here in a way that maybe it isn't in other countries. Um, so in that sense, Israel is definitely pro-natalist, without the government saying it explicitly. So if you're looking at the issue of demography and demographic planning. Most countries have some kind of demographic planning. The United Nations has population forecasts for every country. And planners use these forecasts and every country has demographic forecasts. I think we need to 
when you're looking at Israel and saying what happens in Israel and compare it to Europe, first I have to separate out the situation. Most, if not all, Western Europe countries have below replacement fertility. Below replacement fertility means that each generation is smaller than the one before. It means that the labor force growing up into the country is smaller than the current labor force. It also means that you've got a growing proportion of old people, which is now approaching 20% and the forecast talk of 25% of people who are past working age. This is not Israel's situation at all. Israel is not approaching not 20%, not even 15% old age. So, first of all, we do not have a problem of shrinking labor force. This is the first thing. We do not have a problem of who is going to support the non-working older generation. It's not our problem. That is not a problem we are facing. If anything, we do have a problem, we have an issue that we have a growing younger generation which has to be maintained and schooled and so on. And which is pushing back its age, the age at which it enters the labor force as it requires more and more training to enter a modern, lab to enter a modern labor market. So in that sense, Israel's situation is completely different from that of the Europeans or even the North Americans. Secondly, Israel's issue is not with population size. Israel's issue is with population composition. And I mentioned, we talk, I talked about the issue of assimilation. There is... Feel free to expand. Huh? Feel free to return no, to the next No, no, no. The, um, I mean, the whole ethos of the discourse here is about Jewish singularity, Jewish uniqueness, the fact that we are creating a Jewish state which is going to have be specifically Jewish. Um, we are countering the threat of assimilation. We are countering the trauma of the Holocaust, etc., etc. But in point, but I would. But, to set, but you have to look at that in the context of Israel. You have to look at that in the context of a divided society, a society that has become very, very uh, unequal in its distribution of resources, a society that is integrating waves of immigrants and has always faced the issue of how do we create one society out of these waves of immigrants and one of the ways we do this is through the Jewish discourse through on the one hand the development of threats to our Jewishness to on threats to the speciality of our state as a Jewish state and in that sense, um, much of the discourse in this country on Jewishness, unfortunately, is far more reminiscent on the eugenic discourse of the 20s and 30s in Europe than on the modern demographic issue, which is concerned much more with labor market composition. So, in, in other words, yes, we, we do have a demographic think tanks and demographic and we have demographic uh, academi academics who are uh, who will either paint vivid pictures of what's happening in the Jewish world or paint vivid pictures on the growth of uh, the Arab population and the way they're going to outnumber us if we before we can uh, turn around they'll be outnumbering us and you know exactly who I'm talking about um, when you read the text, some of it is solid demographic analysis, but the interpretation reminds me, unfortunately, as much, very much is a eugenic interpretation that the 
this special group, this, this special chosen people is losing something, is losing its right to have its own little corner, its own bit of God's little acre, so to speak. Um, and in that sense, uh, our refusal to accept labor migrants uh, and our abominable treatment of labor migrants, uh, our refusal to deal with the issue of refugees. Uh, and it's interesting that the, when the, bo the border with Egypt has been open for 30 years, there's been a, a, bo a peaceful border with Egypt which has been unmarked, I mean it's marked, but it's un, uh, uh, unfenced. Uh, and so long as it was, a, it was a passageway for drugs and uh, minor uh, uh, terrorist threats that didn't concern anybody, when people started crossing that border to stay here, then it became a threat and now we're putting up a fence. Uh, that fence could have been in place 30 years ago. So the interesting thing is what, what is the trigger for putting up the fence? Drug trafficking is not a problem, women trafficking is not a problem. Asylum seekers are a problem. Um, and, the fence is go and the fence is going up. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it says something about the things that concern us as a, as a state. Uh, the, 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 as I said, the, the discourse is a, it's a Jewish discourse in the sense of we have to stay something special. But again, this threat, this is a response to the basic insecurity which many, many people feel here. And again, if you're looking at a country in which 20-30% of the labor force is living at minimum, at minimum standards, I'm not talking about people who are outside the labor force, I'm just talking about people who are actually working and are earning minimum and are living at the level of minimum wage, sometimes a bit below, sometimes a bit above. So people whose basic economic security is minimal. And one of the interesting things that happens under these circumstances is people translate this insecurity into visible material threats. And the visible material threat is the other. And the other can be a non-Jewish uh, labor migrant, a non-Jewish asylum seeker, or a Palestinian who wants his own country, who wants his own country. Um, so when you read some of the, not all, when you read some of the new newspaper writings about the Palestinian threat, you'd think this was some large army that, you know, some massive divisions that are waiting to, to invade us. We are we are prepared to, to countenance the, the setting up of a Palestinian state, but they mustn't have tanks and they mustn't have uh, military alliances with anybody and, you know, they, they must be completely emasculated in terms of their military, military abilities, as if this is what, this is the real, this is the real threat. Um, and this is the generation, the, the generation of a sense of threat, which we live on. Okay, the eugenics discourse developed in the late 19th century, early 20th century, in the sense that, we didn't talk about genes then, but there was the sense that there was something that was transmitted from parents to children, and for instance, there was a large movement arguing that those who have the, the, the inferior classes have more children and therefore the growth, the, the national average is going to get worse because we have a growth, a relative growth in the, from amongst the inferior classes. 
and long articles proving that large families, children in large families have lower IQ, either because they are from poorer stock as it was called, or because of the situation of living in a large family gives you fewer opportunities. Um, and this developed into this linked together with uh, views of white supremacy which were very rampant in the first half of the 20th century. Um, that there was something that was transmitted, there was something special that the better people transmitted to their children. Um, and this good quality was liable to be lost with miscegenation, in other words, if you have people crossing the borders and mixing races and so on, you're going to lose this special something. Uh, naturally, this whole approach reached its, should we say, its apotheosis in Nazi doctrine of a master race. And to a large extent, following the Second World War, uh, it became an untouchable, became an untouchable topic. Nobody was prepared to be associated in any way with something that smacked of this sort of, should we say, crass racism. racism. Um, but two generations, three generations after the Second World War, people, those that remember, are no longer with us. Those that grew up on those that grew up on it are now retiring. The new generation doesn't know, doesn't remember, doesn't appreciate, and it's coming out of the closet. It's coming out of the closet again. Racism is a political weapon uh, under a variety of circumstances. Again, particularly under circumstances of insecurity and, you know, patriotism is the last resort of the scoundrel, right? Uh, it, comes, keeps, it keeps coming back and we're hearing it again and again. Uh, some places more, some places less, uh, but you can see the support that Le Pen gets in France and the support that Similar movements are getting in various places in Europe. Uh, Germany is an interesting exception in that sense. Uh, the Germans are still very, very sensitive to, to racist discourse. Uh, but other people are not. And in, to a certain extent, we have this sense in Israel because we were the victims, therefore it cannot happen to us, and therefore we allow ourselves to do and say things which nobody else would dare to do. Um, we, we, we cloak it in various arguments of security and so on, but basically we have a society that not only is unequal economically, but is also unequal politically and excludes, largely excludes, I mean, large excludes that 20% of the population which is not Jewish. Not to mention, of course, the population in the occupied territories, which is completely disenfranchised, which is totally disenfranchised. Um, they're allowed to just say, impolitely play their little games within the Palestinian autonomy uh, that strictly at the lo strictly at the local level and even then we keep our fingers very we keep our fingers very very firmly on the levers in terms of the whole issue of imports and exports and taxation and so on and the fact that we allow the, we allow ourselves to say we don't like what you're doing with that we're not give, going to give you the tax money which which we, we agree we owe you, we know, we know we're collecting this money for the Palestinian Authority, it's their money, but we don't like what you're doing, we're, gonna keep up. we're, not, we're not gonna let it go at the moment. Um, so in that sense, we allow ourselves 
a level of political inequality which nobody else in the so-called civilized world, and I say so-called civilized world, allows themselves so explicitly. I'm not saying that other countries are havens of equality, either politically or econo economically. I think it's, uh, that's a very, you know, I don't think, we're not that far off the map. Uh, but certainly we allow ourselves to say things and do things which others will think twice about. The issue is not an issue of ideas. The issue is look at the here and now. If you understand, understand what people are talking about in this country, what, is, what concerns people, say what the discourse is, to use the modern word. Look at the here and now. And the here and now is of a country that is very, very unequal. The here and now is a country which is very segmented and which has developed a politics of segmentation, a sectorial politics. And we're talking about things like, not only things like Shas, but even things like the Arab parties. So every political group organizes to try and get that little bit extra from the state in one way or another. So put the two together and you have a situation where the politician who can present a message which identifies the us against the other is given that no politician no one has a message which says we can all move together and advance better. The one who presents the message of threat is the one who is able to galvanize people's sense of insecurity. The sense of insecurity is there anyway. So if you want to understand what people are talking about and what the, what the political debate is about, you have to relate it to, what, to how people are living now. In that sense, the, um, the Holocaust is, as we say in Hebrew, kardom lachpobo. It's a spade to dig with. It's something you can use. This is the proof that you can't trust the, uh, the non-Jews. And here, you know, the Mufti was there with Hitler. The fact that the Mufti had been thrown, the, the British had kicked the Mufti out in 38. The fact that the Mufti had lost his power base during the Arab revolt of 36, 39. So that he was in fact politically a non-figure by then. This is irrelevant, you know, this, please do not confuse us with, my, with minor details. The Holocaust was the proof that the world is against us and the Mufti is the proof that the Arab world sided with Hitler against the Jews and it's all grist to the mill in that sense. Um, you know, the whole issue of the exchange, the exchanges, there's a whole, we're not allowed to say this, you know, there's a Holocaust industry in this country it sends kids out to Poland every year. It sends thousands of kids out to Poland to visit the camps and so on. Um, and, they're sp and they're supposed to come back full of gung-ho, you know, it's us against the world and look what the world did to us and so on. The Holocaust was a human tragedy. It was a, you know, it was a universal tragedy. But I think Bowen in that sense is correct when he says it would in many ways, it was the epitome of modernism run wild. You know, this was bureaucracy in the service of racial supremacy. Um, in that sense, we're not immune to this. We have our own bureaucracies that do all sorts of things that we're not too happy with. You know, when, you look at, when we look at what they're doing, we're not too happy with them. Uh, but I don't think, you know, the Holocaust doesn't stand by itself. Under dis different circumstances, 
I can see the Holocaust being a memory, something we need to remember, we have to learn from, but something that brings us together with many other people who have suffered this sort of this sort of calamity and other calamities